So good morning and welcome to the Cybersecurity Task Force Subcommittee on Statewide Coordination and Collaboration. My name is John Godfrey and I'm the Chief Information Security Officer and Associate Vice Chancellor for Information Security with the University of Kansas Medical Center. We have several committee members with us here today. Could each of you go ahead and introduce yourselves? This is Bill Glenn. Uh, I'm the uh, Director of the Kansas Intelligence Fusion Center. Jeff Maxson, Chief Information Security Officer for the State of Kansas. Mike Maida, CIO for the City of Wichita. It's like Jay Imler is still connecting, but he is here. All right, we'll give him just a moment and Well, we have Jay Imler with us. He's the Deputy Attorney General and Chief Information Security Officer for the Office of the Attorney General. So as a friendly reminder, the goal of this subcommittee is to identify, facilitate, and make recommendations to develop successful cross-government and cross-industry collaboration and coordination efforts to further cybersecurity within the state of Kansas. And for some context setting, I thought it would be good if we reviewed some key takeaways from our last meeting. And some of those key takeaways include thoughts around what the state can do to help localities related to cybersecurity, how we need to learn more about how different groups engage with their constituents, and how we might be able to join these groups to help with education, further communications, and continued conversations. The need to have a data security addendum created and then required for all state contracts how to make it easy to locate existing cybersecurity contracts and capabilities within the state, exploring funding opportunities, especially grants, so that it can be used for many things related to cyber across the state, and then further discussions around coordinated information analysis, gathering, and sharing. So with that context, um, we have a couple presenters today that's gonna share some more information with us. And I'm pleased to welcome Court Buffington, He's the executive director of CANRAN, the Kansas Research and Educational Network. And he's gonna provide us with some, some really interesting information and context to continue our conversation today. So Court, thank you for joining us and, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for the opportunity, John, and the rest of the uh, subcommittee members. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to go through mostly uh, some information about CANREN, what we are, and what R&E networks do, not just within the context of Kansas, but in the national ecosystem, and then round up with a little bit on our position with cybersecurity, where we're at, how we're involved today. This is assuming I can make this uh, all this technology work correctly. I did prepare a few slides, mostly so that I stay on track. And it looks like that worked. Hopefully everyone's got those. Yep, I can see it. So a little bit of organizational background on CANRAN and our beginnings. So I'm gonna to try to not just read everything that's up here. Uh, we started in 1992. I like to say that we might have been the original broadband problem in the state when the internet was still largely the domain of universities, in particular research universities. Um, so we were formed in 92. In 1993, the public universities and uh, most of the community colleges and a number of private colleges and universities in the state got together to uh, create a National Science Foundation grant which was the beginning and end of any um, outside funding that we had to build our network, which went live in 1994. By 1996, the grant funding had ended. We became self-supporting. Uh, at that time, CANREN was really a national leader. Uh, one of our spinoffs, the Great Plains Network, which is a regional aggregator in the Great Plains region of the United States, uh, 
Great Plains Network, CanRend, and the University of Kansas became the first uh, entities to go live on the Internet2 network, which was established by the largest research universities in the country after the Internet privatized, after National Science Foundation kind of pulled the plug and the commercial Internet was born. So big time leaders in Kansas back in those early days. Um, by 2000, we had 69 members, uh, connected members across the state, uh, but we were starting to see some leave, uh, mostly over price and pressure from local telecoms. I mean, the broadband, the original broadband problem that started us was already subsiding in some areas, and some of our members did not see the need for what we did on and above typical commercial service. Uh, we were not created by statute. CanRen was completely independently formed by those institutions, although we did partner heavily with the Department of Administration and OITS called DISC at the time. It was really a coalition of the willing. Some changes happened in Kansas starting around 2000. Uh, there was an initiative that is actually created by statute called Can Ed, intended to serve schools, hospitals, and libraries. In this context, schools were, for all intents and purposes, K-12. There was a little bit in the community college realm and pretty much nothing uh, with the Board of Regents schools. It started uh, as an initiative from CanRen, OITS, KSDE, and the State Library of Kansas. Uh, eventually, it was funded. Uh, a statute was created and it was funded, uh, but there was some divergent direction that happened between CanRen's mission and CanEd's mission. CanEd's mission was more about the uh, lowest level of base uh, commodity internet connectivity could, that could be distributed to the widest number of endpoints, whereas CanRen was a little more focused on advanced networking and meeting the uh, some specific needs of research and education beyond what commodity internet did. I, I bring this up because there was there was this opportunity in Kansas where we kind of came together and then uh, it didn't end up happening. In 2013, CanEd was shut down. CanRen scaled its operation back. We did run Network Operations Center and did design engineering work and operations for CanEd. And the result of, of that effort uh, never really converging fully and bringing the two together and then the loss of CanEd is that today, Kansas finds itself uh, one of the trailing RNA networks in the country. Just a bit about what we look like here. CanRen today is 86 total members and the pie chart will show you kind of, uh, well, not kind of, it will show you what constituencies they come from. Hopefully those definitions all make sense. We do have members who are not connected to our network. We provide a few other services that, that they are interested in that did not involve network connectivity. And we have a few who are members just because they believe in supporting our cause. Again, CanRen is a 501c3 public charity. Uh, unlike most public charities, we don't receive any money from outside our own members. So it's fee for service. Organizationally and on, the sur and on the funding topic, we were a service unit of the University of Kansas Center for Research Incorporated initially. And in 2002 is when we became an independent 501c3. We are not quasi-public or an instrumentality of the state. And except for those original NSF grants, we have had no public, uh, direct public funding. Our membership is currently shrinking a little bit, mostly over price point and confusion within the community. Uh, there are a growing number of some of our smaller members who were with CanRen because of predominantly our service, not the service we provide, but how we support it rather, uh, the support that comes with it. Uh, we, we are seeing some of those start to move to commercial providers as the broadband problem gets solved. Unfortunately, there's also a bit of confusion about what that means. There are commercial providers who have, who have uh, pulled CanRen members away, promising that they would still have CanRen services because we're funded by the state, which is not quite correct. Uh, so some work to do there. And a little bit about us um, 
generally what r and &E networks broadly in the country. So I said a moment ago that Kansas is one of the few that do not have predominantly dark fiber backbone. This is based on uh, not having the state investment that happens in many other places. The orange states on the map are those that do not predominantly have ac direct access to dark fiber for their core backbone networks or in states that don't really warrant a statewide backbone because of where their populations exist, at least access, direct access to dark fiber for their core universities to get back to a gigapop, a collection point where they can get access to internet services, the Internet2 network, and other uh, RNE specific things that RNE networks do now. Uh, an example of that would be only about half of the internet service that CanRen distributes to its members actually comes from internet providers today. Between direct peerings with content providers and other networks, uh, about half of our half of our internet traffic doesn't go over the commercial internet. Again, RNE networks are not unique to Kansas. There are at last count at least 39 of us, a state and regional RNE networks in the United States. There are two national networks of interest. Internet2 is the most broadly serving RNEs, and the US Department of Energy's ESNet, which is mostly research only based. There's a national organization uh, of RNE networks called the Quilt, and a regional collector within the Great Plains region I've already mentioned, GPN. And some peers' names that you might have heard or you may in the future in the region. MoreNet is our counterpart in Missouri, OneNet in Oklahoma. The names are kind of giveaways here. Aron in Arkansas, Network Nebraska. Uh, less obvious, Front Range Gigapop in Colorado. And uh, we do a lot in, we have done a lot of work in collaboration with uh, our peers Learn down in Texas. That's for Lone Star Education and Research Network. Nationwide, this is what all of the RE networks look like uh, laid on a map of the US together and what our coverage, uh, core coverage of our backbones are. So, not a unique thing in Kansas. Uh, a lot of this going on around the country. We're a pretty big community. Okay, so the hopefully the topic on everyone's mind how do we intersect with cybersecurity? Uh, it is a core part of RE network missions. Some things that CanRen focuses on, we do uh, flow, collect flow data on the traffic on our network. That's not packet payloads, but we do, and it necessarily is sampled. We cannot collect, uh, do not have the means to collect every packet header, but uh, the sampling is, uh, is detailed enough that we tend to pick up on most bad things happening out there as long as there's some volume to it. So we do that, we provide information from the flow monitoring system to our, uh, to our members. DDoS mitigation, uh, we implement black hole routing, traffic diversion, which hopefully this group finds more interesting. We do have the ability to divert uh, attack traffic so it can be captured for analysis. And finally, for those volumetric DDoS attacks that are potentially terabits in nature, uh, we can divert those to a cloud scrubbing center and bring back the clean traffic. So that keeps uh, that keeps member networks online during attacks. That's pretty important. By the way, anecdotally, the majority of actual volumetric DDoS attacks that we have seen within our network have actually been students at K-12s attempting to take their school's connection offline during state assessment testing. We employ uh, multiple levels of Akamai's Enterprise Threat Protector. We get an extremely good deal from Akamai on this. Uh, for those maybe not, uh, not familiar with Akamai's product, it's very similar to parts of Cisco Umbrella or OpenDNS. It, uh, it allows, uh, allows DNS-based security to thwart malware, phishing, botnet, and some ransomware exploitation websites. We do remote vulnerability scanning at no additional fee. Uh, by the way, all of the DDoS mitigation is at no additional fee. The flow monitoring, no additional fee. 
We do provide the Akamai service uh, at a low level tier intended for very small institutions at no additional fee. Uh, larger members want to have more control over turning the knobs on that service and that does start introducing some additional fees. The vulnerability scanning, again, no fee. Shadow server reporting, no fee. We do also offer some on-premise and cloud-based next-gen firewall uh, solutions. Okay, next-gen firewall, what I really mean here is not just your traditional stateful firewall, but adding in things like intrusion detection and prevention and, and other more modern firewall services. What we see in our world, security posture within our member organizations is typically directly tied to the size of the institution. Little uptake on the no additional charge services from smaller institutions. We are um, a little bit surprised about this. I have another screen here with some stats. Our um, protection services from Akamai that we offered uh, just short of a year ago, we opened up to making available for no additional charge. None of our 21, uh, 22 at the time, connected school districts, public school districts have taken us up on that offer. Uh, the only uptake we've had on that was a other nonprofit organization and Lawrence Memorial Hospital. The only uh, the only the only members who have taken us up on that as the higher tier paid service are the city of Lawrence and the University of Kansas. And for network protection services, the on-prem firewall, interestingly enough, we have um, four out of the uh, 21 connected public school districts that avail themselves of that service. Pretty low uptake. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of ten members total using that. And only one member has approached us for vulnerability scanning. So not a lot of uptake there. Why is that? At our public universities, we see a lot of special, specialization in IT. They have security officers. They have chief security, uh, chief information security officers on campus. Hello, John. Um, you start getting into medium size or smaller community colleges and public school districts, all but maybe the largest 10. And we start seeing IT staffs of a few people at most, and they all have to be IT generalists. None have specialized skill sets. And then you get to the majority of the state's public school districts uh, of 286 total, and the majority of those by count probably have one dedicated IT generalist, and that's all. So I think there are definitely some serious issues with the amount of resources available to be up to speed on what needs to be done and take actions. We have a bit of a chicken and egg problem here. I think everybody wants it. Nobody wants to pay for it. And maybe beyond even wants to pay for it. There's a lot of competition at public institutions for available resources. And those aren't, I mean, ultimately it may be money, but a lot of times it has to do with available staff and the time staff have to look into things. Our focus has largely remained on what protection we can build into our statewide network uh, and where we can work reasonably with economies of scale. That's why you see us focusing more on things we can do network wide. We couldn't put a network wide firewall in because it would be almost impossible to one, find a device capable of having enough varied profiles to serve the varying needs of our members from uh, research university to uh, healthcare to K-12, uh, public libraries. They're all very, very different in their needs. So we've stated the larger things that we can layer on. We believe in that layered approach, and we've tried to layer in the things that we can do as cost-effectively as we can. And this is definitely something that RNE networks feel a need to do more of. I have a URL up here for Minds We Need. It's uh, a movement nationally amongst RNE networks to try to demonstrate uh, how those of us who have been re better resourced have done much, much more than just provide network connectivity and the work still left to be done in the United States. We really looked deeply into trying to do more with cybersecurity. Uh, we've tried several things. We looked into a shared CISO as a service program for our smaller members. We did not have enough interest to get it off the ground. 
but at least I'm happy to say that we were able to help the Kansas Independent College Association and Foundation uh, with some of very little. They did the vast majority of it on their own, but sharing some of our experiences helped them get a program off the ground within their membership to do that. That is all I have for today. Contact info up there if anyone would like to reach out to me later. Um, I'm sure you can get it through the staff liaison for the subcommittee uh, contact information, uh, but it's right here. I'll leave that up for a couple of seconds longer. If anyone has a question or a comment or would like to talk offline, I am always available. And so, any questions? Yeah, Court, thank you so much for, for that presentation. There's a lot of valuable information, context and ideas for us to consider. I, I was curious, do you mind bringing back up the slide that showed the distribution of the, uh, the members that you have? It, it, I don't remember all the counts, but uh, from what I recall, there was there's quite a few different types of groups that are representative of your membership. And I, I think one of the things that that stood out to me, um, you know, is that diversity in your membership really, I think, fits in well with what we're talking about in the subcommittee about um, cross government partnerships, as well as looking at private and public partnerships. And, and so to me, that, that was one of the thoughts that came into my mind here. Um, do you see, from your perspective, especially with this diversity in your membership, um, are there other opportunities or other ways you think that um, further partnerships or cross uh, member activities can occur? You know, do you have any thoughts about how that might be expanded specifically around cyber and, and the services you provide? Oh my, okay, so um, I've known John for quite a while and he is always good at asking difficult questions that and usually involve me having to be very candid. Uh, I'm gonna start by answering that in a direction that's gonna make you all sigh and I'm gonna leave that very quickly. Canren's problem has been resources. Uh, having to only having a resource pool of resources that come from the membership we serve to serve them has really been a problem for us to fully realize the potential of an RE network. I think that the, um, so while we started as RE networks, that's research and education, um, during the Recovery Act about a decade ago, most RE networks in the US got a fair amount of federal funding to help expand their operations. We did not. Uh, Kansas chose not to take that step. And at that time, they expanded to serve all of what the NTIA refers to as community anchor institutions. Canren made that choice voluntarily to branch out and serve those groups. And we have had some success there. I think that the best interest, and this could get me in trouble with my board of directors, so I'm glad it's being recorded. I think the best interest of the state would be looking at how to actually bring Canren and the state closer together and in a mutually acceptable collaboration and partnership to leverage what an r &E network can do with a little bit more clout and involvement from the state. We are a conduit to do this, but without stronger partnership with our state, I think we will continue to fall flat on, on, on the promise of what an r &E can do. Most of those other network, those other organizations you see in there, the at large slash other at 22% are not connected to our network today. They're here for some other service. And the way we really work towards protection is to provide it at the layers of the network. And I would love to see more of that connected. I hope that helped answer. It, it did, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to pause for a moment. Does anyone else on the subcommittee have questions for court? Um, you know, looking at that diverse pool, um, you know, how do you, do you struggle with some of the same channel, like communicating with them at large? You know, you mentioned you, you started creating like the CISO as a service or you have some of these other things that um, they just don't uptake. Um, you know, even your free services, or is it, is it a communication challenge? Is it a bandwidth challenge in terms of resources on both sides? I mean, because that, that is a universal problem sometimes we see is sometimes the ones that don't have the resources and you're offering free tools to them, they don't 
take you up on them. Um, yeah, I, but it becomes a, a is it more of a messaging problem to get them to follow through type thing? You know, what challenges are you seeing with that? Yeah, we thought it was messaging. So we actually spent some money on outsourcing marketing, something that, you know, a, a little nonprofit really has no specialty in the idea of marketing, but we hired some marketing professionals to help with communication. And so I think we have communicated fairly well. I think it's really a contention for resources at these institutions we serve, especially the smaller ones. You know, some of the things that we do at no additional fee, I mean, they would be worthless to, to someone like KU. Uh, they're not offered at a scale that makes sense for KU. So for, you know, for fees, we can band together and, and do volume purchase and all, but for that, focusing on the smaller organizations and the things we've been able to do at no additional fee, I think largely it's not, it's a contention for resources within the organization more than messaging, which is what's been bringing me around to the idea of, uh, which, which is kind of new for Canran, the idea that if we don't all work together and find ways to work with the state to move this agenda forward that we are never as, as a state we're not going to get there we need to be all in together to do it so we can um you know things that we see i'm heavily involved with other r e networks around the nation and i know how the successful ones have been successful usually they are much more involved with their state there are some type of incentive for them, and, and it doesn't even have to be large, but there's some type of incentive for them to pay more attention or put more, re maybe some incentives are the resources, maybe the incentives are, um, some of them have been policy in nature, some of them are, uh, some states will do things like mandate certain things with the security evaluation. And rather than say, you have to do it this way, there will be a subsidy if they, if they do it through an r and &E network that's vetted and built the security assessment, like with the Department of Education uh, together in partnership. So you've got to do it. If you go this route where we have created an easy path for you, the incentive is that you can get it done for free or very low cost, but you know they don't say you have to do it this way. There's always uh, the success where I see great success in states or in states that are more collaborative than we are, admittedly, and some of that is Canran's fault. I wouldn't put that on anyone else, but it always involves something to incentivize uh, being more involved. I, I'm just trying to understand the landscape because some of those are some of the same struggles we see from a state perspective and working with our partners and those yeah, that's like on, every, on the state network so everybody's interested but it seems to be nobody has the cycles to really take it on appreciate the input so court um real quick the we just had a discussion internally uh, at the at the city about incentives and whether they work or not um and basically the city manager suggested the data he saw was that, and this is around healthcare, so completely different uh, topic, but similar in terms of concept. Are, do you have data that would suggest that that some type of um, subsidy or some type of monetary benefit actually has been? I mean, we believe this to be true, but what he found in this particular case was it was absolutely not true. Um, so I'm just curious if 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 there's data around around that it, an actual data set i could load in and produce some immediate stats out of no i do not have that uh what i'll but i'll throw you a couple of examples of things that we do know uh very close to us and yeah healthcare is a little different and admittedly we don't do as much with with city and county governments but what we have been actually it's been our our best success in the last five years uh, i'm going to focus on k-12 because that's a huge group and it's one that we know pretty well and, and have a great deal of struggles with. So example, Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, um, if you join the state r &E network, which is a much more of a collaborative between the state and the r and &E operator is not, you know, the r and &E operator there is not a completely independent 501c3 like we are. But so in Oklahoma, if you're a K-12, if you join and get service from your r and &E network, then the state funds the part of your connectivity that is not funded by the e-rate program 
They're not required to, but if they don't, then they don't get the state funding. The moment they're on the state's r and &E network, then that opens the door to providing additional cybersecurity features, either baked into the network itself or part of the, um, a part of the network service or discounted by the volume that the state network provides. And, and actually, in point of fact, what they do in Oklahoma is the state r and &E network has leveraged several very large central core firewall chassis. So rather than having to duplicate the physical infrastructure out at every premise, they bring the traffic into the network and then they do it in a virtualized environment statewide. So Oklahoma does that. Um, in the states, um, there are similar stories at just about everyone who's been successful. And that's the kind of thing that we see as we see states that have, and so I consider that an incentive, right? Okay, join the state r &E network and the state's gonna pick up the tab on, uh, I don't think it's 100%, but it is on a good deal of the remaining expense that you'd have uh, in, aside from what the e -rate pro, federal E-rate program funds. Every state where there is a clear uh, success story always has something like that behind it. The problem with getting clear statistics, I think, is that they are extremely varied in how they do it. Um, Utah, I, I know Utah well. I realize they're not real close to us. But in Utah, for example, the state uh, mandated security assessments for all of its public education institutions. And if that is, and then the state developed with its r &E network what the standards would be and how that would be performed. If the educational institution gets their security assessment through the state r &E network, then um, it is, uh, I believe it is completely free if they get it there. They can get it wherever else, but they're going to pay for it. So the most resource conscious which is almost all of the state's public education chooses to get that through the r and &E network, which again, like Oklahoma, the same thing, then that starts providing more information back to the state as a whole on getting information about where the vulnerabilities were. You know, if, this, if the state's involved in performing those tasks, then they immediately get feedback to see where vulnerabilities are, what's happened, better ways to improve policy. So I, I think there's an incentive both ways. Yeah, okay. and and that makes sense. And and you believe that that uh, Canran would would have the the ability to 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 move to that scale. Yeah, uh, I I do. Our we are as small as we are, and and please understand, this is not court coming looking for money from someone. But as I have been asked over the years to look into why we're falling short of what many of our, our peer networks are doing, this is what I found. They are more tightly connected to their states, including their governance models, and they're working in close partnership with their states to do this. We've ramped up before we could ramp up again. Uh, we were, today we're a staff of 10 at our peak during the CanEd years. We were uh, a total number of people, close to 30. Uh, it's it is the kind of thing that organizations like ours across the country do. It's not uh, just because CanRen has not been big enough to do it at that scale doesn't mean we can't. I can tell you, I wouldn't want to take that on if we were not partnered with the state and we couldn't leverage some of the experiences in these areas that the Department of Administration's had running their own network. You know, we need to be working together on this stuff. If we were going to create a larger connectivity base around the state, we would need more backbone fiber. There is an opportunity for collaboration with the Department of Transportation uh, to get some of those assets. I think it is all doable. My view would be that as a state, we all need to work together in a more holistic view to make that a reality. It's not one, it's not one organization that just does it. It's a lot of us working together and can run being more coupled than we are today. Thank you. And this is Jeff again. Another kind of question is how, you know, kind of circling back to the cybersecurity perspective, do you guys operate any sort of model in doing notifications or working with 
your partners if they have an incident type thing or well, what does that kind of model look like for, for you guys? Uh, we have as a fairly small staff that, that has to operate really lean. We, um, we have pretty simple procedures for that. So if we are in, if we see something and we try, we have, uh, from our membership, we have a network technology advisory committee, which helps our technical staff define what kind of thresholds we want to look to for notification. Typically, if we see anything and, and the, the threshold's pretty low today, if anything gets flagged in the flow monitoring system, any of the stuff we have in place network wide, that triggers an immediate notification. Uh, I say immediate, if it's a small member that does not have anyone on call 24 hours a day, we'll wait till the business day starts. But uh, we pretty much notify immediately and we provide any data that we have. And our goal is to typically be able to offer to help in any way that we can. For our members that have us handle things like managed on-premise firewall, we do not write the security policy. Well, we actually author the technical security policy that goes in the device, but the, the organizational policy is defined by our member. So they define their organizational policy. We implement that policy, including what their thresholds are for notification. Um, we do tend to keep a lot of data. And in fact, I want to share something with you guys. I wasn't going to bring up because it's kind of nerdy, but this is kind of cool. The intersection of Y and r &E network can have some advantage here. We recently had a K-12. I do not know the nature, uh, exact nature of why they requested the information. It appears to be some sort of audit, but they requested a report on potential security incidents, every one of them for the last year. I mean, really detailed, like pretty much anything that their firewall that we operate blocked. Uh, that was that involved running analysis on about 1.5 terabytes of log files. Here's where the part about being involved with the researchers comes in. We were able to gain access to a supercomputer that was able to load all 1.5 terabytes of log data into RAM at one time. And we use the same type of computational methods that researchers use to analyze research data to distill down those log files and pull out exactly the things that uh, the K-12 was interested in, put them in order, cull the data, reformat it, and provide them the stuff they needed. So plug for r &E networks, because we're also involved in the research community and work with high performance computing and cyber infrastructure, resources, we have some unique abilities when something like that comes along to tap into. It's not that we're geniuses. We just get an opportunity to work with another uh, another side of our organization where we were able to go say, hey, yeah, we we need a really big computer for a while to, to crunch on some of this stuff and 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 had that available. So um yeah, to, to end that up. Sorry, but I really, that anecdote seemed like it was a really good one to bring up right now, that there are resources that we have available in our state that I think we don't necessarily think about using in all the ways they could be used. And that's one of the goals as we've looked at from the task force is we know Kansas does have a lot of great capabilities and it's just figuring out what they are, where they are, and then how do we coordinate and collaborate with everybody to make them available in, the, in appropriate fashion? So, so no, that's good to know. Um, I appreciate that insight. Yeah, I really do wish I knew exactly why the K-12 needed it. <laughs> All right, any other questions for court? Seeing none, thank you, Court. Uh, we appreciate you joining us today and sharing the information. Uh, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next part of our conversation today. And this is gonna be more an open discussion with the committee members. And really what we're looking for are any themes or ideas or recommendations, anything that stood out to you so far based upon our previous work in the subcommittee and what we've learned um, really maybe guiding us more towards things that we should consider or, or recommendations that we're thinking about um, and as we're thinking about that, yes, Court, you're on mute. I neglected to ask earlier, may I stay and listen in, um, 
to this, the rest of the conversation, because I would like to know a little bit more about what you guys do. If that's not acceptable, I'm happy to drop off. So as, uh, as far as I understand, you're welcome to stay. Um, I see Jeff nodding his head as well. So um, yeah, Thank you're you. welcome to, yep, you're welcome to stay. Thanks for checking. All right, so back to the subcommittee members. What are we thinking? Um, you know, uh, have we have we learned anything new that might shape or guide future recommendations that we need to consider? Uh, I mean, just going off of you know what Court talked about, and their their base again, it's kind of that additional avenue to work through to start reaching out to entities that we might not have had in the past. Um, you know, because like I said, the state we have our partners that we regularly work with, but finding those others that kind of uh, can help relay messaging to the broader audience is a key resource that to, to continue to keep pulling out and identify and how do we we work together in those those aspects. So I, I agree, Jeff. It sounds like based upon the diverse membership that there definitely are opportunities for education, collaboration, and and even you know broader themes about cybersecurity awareness, perhaps. Um, you know, we learned last time about awareness and training being uh, being a focus area that, that we need to consider. Um, you know, looking back at that list from last time, there was instant management, awareness and training, investigation forensics, security operations center, and vulnerability management. And it, it felt like what I heard today was that several of those feel like they could be provided at scale through CANRAN. And uh, to your point, Jeff, connecting a bunch of other uh, constituents and, and, and entities across the state, maybe that um, don't have ready access to some of that. Is, is that what you were, you were getting at with that? Am, am I on the right track or did I misunderstand? No, you are. I mean, that's, and that's kind of why I asked Court about, you know, what kind of messaging they're able to do, things like that. So, um, you know, and again, I'm just looking at it from our state perspective, just how we engage organizations you know there's still huge blind spots of you know things that we do to you know same thing of course there's a lot of things we can do to assist um, as we talked about like contracts and things like that there's a lot of things they can do and to assist in how do we as a subcommittee come up with how do we how do we enable the state enable our partners to communicate and collaborate more efficiently and effectively to say, hey, there are these resources here. In many cases, they're either reduced in cost or in some cases free. You know, what's the challenges of not having the uptake? So we can kind of start, okay, how do we address those uptake issues? Um, you know, if it is a resource thing, okay, what are some of the other things? Do we look at trying to direct if it's a public entity you know, some of the cybersecurity grant funding that might be coming down the pipe or, or things like that, make recommendations and, you know, here's the people to help do the grant process, et cetera. So, you know, I think you're right on the same path I'm going down as well, John. Okay, thank you for that. So I'm gonna pick on Bill or Jay, what, what are you all thinking? This is Bill. Uh, I think uh, Jay uh, has not been able to connect uh, and get a voice line up and going, so he's in listening mode only. And uh, I guess I'm still trying to, to wrap my mind around uh, how the, this network, that I guess I never uh, knew about it before. I, I participated in an old network back in the 90s called MidNet, where from Washburn University, we looked into K-State, and K-State, I think, went up to Nebraska and then on into to St. Louis, but uh, long before the internet, and I think that might be where this grew from, but uh, I, I think there's uh, an opportunity to consider uh, that penetration that they have uh, to the, the K-12 uh, arena and also to the smaller entities uh, who are their customers. Uh, for my position, you know, my role is, is a pretty small niche uh, player in, in this whole big game. Um, so I, I'm not sure. Uh, I know in our world, we have difficulty uh, finding partners 
who have the bandwidth to to uh, partner with us. Uh, again, it goes back to resources and having people uh, to do the work. So uh, that's kind of uh, I'm I'm intrigued by uh, by the network. Uh, I just didn't know much about it previously. Gotcha. Well, and from like uh, information sharing and an analysis perspective, um, it, it feels like from what we heard, there may be some opportunity that could be explored there further. Ab absolutely. Uh, with, with my partners, uh, that's, uh, what, that's exactly what we do is we, we uh, extract uh, information uh, uh, on uh, data networks to um, and then analyze it, and of course it's always a, a challenge uh, not to boil the ocean. You have to be able to uh, either sample or somehow uh, deduplicate um, traffic uh, to do the analysis. And so uh, I, I do believe there's opportunities, and, and I'd, I'm interested in learning more about that. Gotcha, and that makes sense. Um, and it sounds like they. Uh, Canran, at least, they have some experience uh, based on some of the stories that the court had shared with us. Um, and then even the, the data analysis expertise from some of the researchers, uh, that, that really stood out in my mind as well about, um, you know, one of the key themes that we discussed in this group before was about coordinated information analysis, gathering and sharing. Um, and so uh, I know Jeff talked about just trying to understand where those pockets of expertise and resources around the state, and then uh, how do we how do we understand that? And then really, how do we start putting those pieces together to to take advantage of it in a broader context? Um, and so it sounds like there's a lot of great components already in place, and maybe it's just a matter of connecting some folks and 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 stitching some of that together into a to a broader capability set. Yeah, and that's one of the challenges we struggle with. A lot of times we'll, we'll get information from peers or our federal partners regarding institutions across the state, whether it's local governments, K-12, things like that. A lot of times we don't know who to reach out to just saying, hey, somebody's seeing something um, out there going on in the world, whether it's some sort of attack or something referenced in an attack to an organization. We may have that information. We just have no way to share it. And so finding out, you know, if there are these organizations kind of like the CANRIN or that person might, or that entity might sit on the CANRIN network, how do we share it appropriately? Who are the appropriate points of contact to distill it? Because, you know, in some cases, is it feasible for one organization to have a master list of, you know, however many organizations it is, or if it kind of filters down in that, that pyramid model that we send it over to this group, they board it. And again, it's just, what does that model look like for Kansas as a whole? How does, how does that work? I mean, how do the, the in institutions or organizations want to be notified? Um, is it more of a directly or kind of come through other entities and support that? I mean, that's those are some of the questions I have kind of in back of my mind of hopefully we can kind of work through some of those challenges. So, Mike, I, I'm curious, um, especially from like the city more local perspective. Um, do you all have any services with Canran now or do you have a different uh, service provider? Yeah, no, we, we use commercial uh, providers. We don't, we don't do anything with Canran. Um, now our library does do a lot of E-rate stuff. Um, so there might be some potential. I know WSU, um, is integrated or they use CanRan, I, I, I believe they still do. Um, <clears throat> but no, we, we, uh, we, do, we do much like uh, private sector. Gotcha. Do you, from your perspective, do you think some of the stuff that we've learned about, especially about some of the capabilities, is that something like from a local city, county perspective, you think that would be helpful capability for, for places like that? Uh, I mean, I think there's always an there's there's always an opportunity. Uh, we have we have a CISO. Um, we do a lot of different partnerships. Um, so you know, uh, the size we are, um, that makes quite a bit of a difference. Um, I, I I'm not saying, and and uh, Jeff and I kind of talked about this a little bit uh, on another call on, on the in the sense of. 
if you think of um, um, you know an IT catalog, um, so there there very well might be some things you know sim, um, but we don't have staffing right to, to where it makes sense. Um, so would there be some things that that we might be we we might be able to um, outsource, uh, so to speak? Uh, yeah, I mean the the reason we don't do it is it's not cost effective for us. Uh, today, um, but you know, if we could supplement that and and do it, um, um, you know, with an entity like like this, then yeah, I, I think I, I think everyone would would be interested in that on a on kind of a, a, a you know a pick and choose basis uh, because pretty much everybody's going to be in a hybrid environment uh, to some degree. So uh, with that in mind, then you know we should be able to take advantage of of uh, you know some of the some of the offerings or potential offerings. Sorry, that was a little long long winded, but but that's um, you know it's it's uh, we we actually operate um, it, it, I think much like uh, private sector. We just don't um, we just don't have that single you know go make money um, imperative. Uh, but but yeah, for the most part, that's that's kind of uh, that's kind of where we're at. So the, I'm yeah I'm very interested in in you know some of the potentials uh, that might exist. I know smaller entities. I I you know would be shocked if and most of that's probably just misunderstanding, right? Um, a lot of them we talked about this before. A lot of them don't think they have a problem, right? We're we're too small. We're not a target. Well, that's just not true. So, so yes, um, on a, you know, on a specific basis, we would probably not on the connectivity. Well, maybe even the connectivity side, um, if we can, you know, lower costs from that perspective, then, uh, yeah. Well, and, and I think that makes sense. You're right. I remember last time we had a really interesting discussion around uh, the idea of some of these smaller uh, entities just not understanding what that threat environment looks like and how they are in fact targets and um, and then even just trying to think through like the implications of that like what capabilities do I need what do I need to be thinking about and then um, I've seen especially in some smaller entities where it almost becomes too much right it, it, it feels like it's an overwhelming task how do you get your arms around it and then I, I think that sometimes prevents action as well um, where it just seems like too big of a mountain to, to climb up. And uh, it seems like maybe we're not a target. So, you know, let's just continue with business as usual until we have a problem. Um, I think the economies of scale concept is uh, another part that really stood out to me in this conversation um, about many of the entities across the state are going to have similar services and similar uh, challenges for things that they need to do. And uh, cyber costs, uh, at least from my perspective in my organization, nothing gets cheaper every year. Uh, everything continues to go up, sometimes quite dramatically. Uh, there's constant change in the cyberspace in terms of capabilities and technologies and, and tools and instrumentation. Um, you know, it used to be that I could look at a five, maybe 10 year runway on things. Uh, five years, I think, is pretty much gone at this point. You know, now it's looking more like a two to three year runway. And sometimes depending upon the capability and, and, and how the world is changing, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to continue to be able to pivot and move and have that agility, especially at scale when costs are going up. And so, um, you know, one of the things that, that I'm gonna keep thinking about as we do our work here is, is that notion of economies of scale and how can we um, uh, think about that more broadly as we, as we learn more from different groups and, and how can we leverage those economies of skills? Because I, I think that's going to be one of the, the drivers that we have to think about for bringing capability uh, from this whole estate perspective. Yeah, I, I think that's true, John. I think one of the big, one of the big challenges for us then um, from that perspective will be the trust component. Um, you know, you're, 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 you're talking about a, a very uh, important cog in the wheel, so to speak, 
Um, and, and so, you know, there's, there's going to have to be those relationships built. Um, I think before you can, before we'll be able to get, uh, people engaged, um, and, and, you know, willing to, to say, yeah, here, I'll, I'll hand this off. Right. Um, I, I, you know, it's, but it's not going to be a whole, well, I don't know. That'll, it'll be interesting. I, I think uh, a lot of people will do it just because they won't have any options. Or hopefully it's not a situation where it's better than nothing, right? Like uh, it, hopefully. Yeah, and some... that's what I meant. Yeah, more more around the, the you know, the, the, the Goddards of the world that, hey, I, I really don't have, and I didn't mean that we're forcing them to do something. I'm just saying, like you just said, Right, that's they, they really don't have better options. So this provides at least, right, the uh, a security blanket. Um, so you know, I, I, I think, you know, for us to start somewhere, that's, and I don't want to get into, you know, we're, we're probably trying to get into the weeds here in terms of solutions, but, but uh, uh, I think in terms of recommendations, um, you know, having, um, you know, some entity like that, and I, I'd actually been thinking about that um, available, uh, I think would be, you know, really important um, because you, you, you would be able to leverage economies of scale. And, and as you said, you know, it's, everything's getting a lot more expensive. Everything's moving to the cloud, whether we like it or not. Um, and, and so if, if, you know, if we can create a, a, a private or a, a private cloud instance that's available, um, uh, then, you know, I think that that provides some of the smaller entities um, in, in multiple cases, um, you know, that, that opportunity, right, to engage and, and at least um, have some coverage uh, from a, a security basis. That, that makes sense to me. Um, are, uh, we're, we're getting close on time here. I wanna make sure that we have some time for our next uh, guests. So um, are there any final thoughts or comments at this point from the, the subcommittee members before we move on to our next guest presentation? All right. Well, that was a good discussion. I look forward to our next uh, discussion here after this presentation. So with that, I am pleased to welcome uh, Steve Funk, the Director of IT for the Board of Regents, and his guest, Ken Harmon, the CIO for Wichita State University and the current Regents Information Technology Council, or RITC Chair. Um, they're here today to share some additional information with us. Uh, Steve and, and Ken, thank you for joining us today, and I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Um, is my camera on? I'm not actually, I tried to turn it on. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. So my name is Steve Funk. Uh, thank you for having us. I am the director of the IT at the Kansas Board of Regents. I sometimes feel the need to clarify that position, and, and this is a case where I kind of feel that um, in government speak, a lot of times Board of Regents is talking about the whole entire system. Um, that is not me or not primarily my role. My role is to maintain IT for the actual board and the board staff. So that's why I asked um, Ken to back me up here on issues that might involve more of the university perspective. Of course, you've also got John who is well aware of all that. Um, I hate to follow Court because I always feel like he's way more interesting than I am, and I don't have a lot to talk about, I don't think. I told Ali, you know, it could be a very short presentation and then we can have the discussion. Um, but my understanding was um, that you were interested in looking at how, how the Board of Regents collaborate and communicate, and then maybe some challenges that, that we have. So, um, to start with the communication piece, there's there's the um, there's the formal method of communication that the board has. So the board can can speak to 
primarily they work through the university presidents um, and information flows down in that direction. There are a number of subcommittees within, within the board, the business officers, the academic officers. They all communicate as well, but, but it all kind of focuses in among the presidents and then from the presidents to the regents. With the community colleges, it's, it's even less so. There is a, there is, it's, it's still the same basic method, although the, the regents don't govern the community colleges. They, they coordinate is the official term, and I don't know that I can define what that means. But they, um, th there's still a, a, a group of community council or community college presidents who communicate with the board and also with a, another group at the board, the, the Technical Education Authority. So that's the formal method of communication. Informally, there's a lot going on, especially among the universities. There's uh, the RITC group that Ken is currently chairing. Um, the the, the university CIOs who get together monthly, the information security officers uh, at the universities get together monthly as well. I think they get busy and sometimes those meetings get skipped, but um, that's the intent at least. And, and I know that that's open not only to universities, but also to community college um, information security officers if they're interested in attending. Um, there are You've just talked to Ken Wren, so Ken Wren provides uh, a valuable listserv and the technical representatives, and there's communication going on that way. Um, and one of one of the, I, I think one of the really outstanding methods of communication for IT is the annual CHET conference, the Computer and Higher Education Conference of Kansas, or something like that. But, but check is the initials and it's put on annually and it's open to, uh, it's hosted by the, by the universities, but it's open to anybody in higher ed, privates, community colleges. Uh, and I, I always look forward to that and I know everybody does. Uh, it's a great way to share information, to gather uh, new techniques um, and those kinds of things. So I think that's a really great way of communication. Um, I'll stop there. Um, those, those are the methods that I know of communication. I don't know if Ken has any others or if you have any questions about that. Uh, I would just add that uh, whether they're CIOs or information security officers, they do uh, tend to participate in other organizations, whether they're state organizations or uh, just industry organizations, and they bring that information back and share among those formal networks that, that Steve was just talking about. Yeah, that's a good point. So they they participate in ITAB and um, the State Security Council. They're pretty instrumental in that. And yeah, there's a lot of representation. Uh, so I'll go on to the challenges and then we can circle back to communication if that's the interest. Um, the challenges are, are not different from any other organization. Uh, you've already talked about increasing costs. Um, everything goes up. It's hard to find qualified personnel. But there are there are probably some more unique challenges at the universities. They have um, uh, the research institutions, especially, have lots of uh, research grants that have their own special compliance issues. There's the Department of Defense. There's um, oh, I, I can't even name them all. But pretty much every compliance initial that's out there, they have to follow the the GDPR, the California, the CUI. Um, and, and of course, the state, because they are officially state agencies, so they, they comply with that as well. So, so there's, there's a challenge of just a, a wide variety of compliance issues. Um, they also have the challenge that they have their customers living on site. So they have students that have needs. Um, and honestly, the, the students are probably the highest demand of IT services and of any age group. So they are expecting a high level of IT service and that all has to be done securely, but, but it has to be done quickly and on time. So um, sitting back and waiting is, is not really an option for the universities because they, they have to satisfy their customers. Um, of course, they have foreign, out of state, uh, a wide range of staff and students that, that may complicate security issues. 
one one interesting aspect that that has come up before not recently but it, but i remember in the past they have they had the issue where they have a gray area where they have students who are students and have to be protected with all the protections that students should be protected with but they are student workers and so they are also technically employees of the state of kansas that have to comply with all of those measures and and that provides some some challenges at some point that um I don't know if there's a, a defined way to work around that, but but we kind of had to work our way through those kinds of issues. Um, I'm looking through for other things. I, I think that's most of what I had to talk about. Ken, did, did you have any to add to that? Yeah, I can, I can just say that having spent almost all my career in private industry and just recently coming over to higher education, it is um, surprisingly much more um, difficult to secure this environment than what I'm used to, for sure. I mean, the fundamental nature of a university is to be open and to share, to collaborate, you know, with uh, with the community, with researchers and other institutions, uh, with the government, industry partners. Um, so it's about sharing, 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 which cybersecurity tends to be more about protecting and protecting. Um, and that makes it very, very hard, as, as Steve mentioned. So the, the challenges are, are uh, quite a bit higher than what most institutions see. Um, and at the same time, um, there's a, a wider variety of compliance uh, obligations than most institutions see. So Steve mentioned several of them, defense, CMMC kinds of contracts. You know, that's a, that's a compliance area that, that, that a lot of our universities have to think about. If you have clinics and you're teaching dentists and doctors and psychologists and things like that, then you have HIPAA requirements, um, FERPAs, the higher education requirements. Um, if you have research, grants into um, uh, engineering kinds of fields or, or anything that, that, um, that the government is helping to sponsor in terms of, of uh, deeper research, then you have to make sure that when you have students and student employees that they are U.S. persons and because often non-U.S. persons are precluded from working in that area. And so you have to uh, manage that level of compliance. So the variety um, uh, of partnerships that we have drives complexity and the compliance requirements that go with it also drive complexity. So very interesting environment. So that's really all that I had um, on tap to talk about. I'd be glad to further the conversation if you have questions. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, uh, both Steve and, and Ken. Those are some very important data points, I think, for us to think about. Um, one of the things that stood out to me is there's two things that seem to grow, uh, compliance requirements and costs. And um, it, it seems like those are interesting challenges that all of us are, are, are gonna have to figure out how to navigate. And I don't know where that fits in exactly with this, this approach that we're thinking about in the subcommittee, but there may be some opportunity about, um, I think we talked last time about some type of shared service or shared assessment or, or something to that order where uh, maybe that fits in with some of the expanding compliance requirements um, and or defraying certain costs from uh, each entity having to hire external parties to come assist with some of that. Yeah. I will say that, that we're seeing not just compliance expectations increase um, from government entities, but also um, expectations from our industry partners to validate or have some level of assurance that we are protecting their data. Because when we partner with, with uh, different uh, private entities, they share information with us. They wanna make sure that we're protecting the information they share. And so they want some level of warranty that that's being protected. So that's increasing um, our costs as well, right? you know, our time commitments. Uh, it's not just government compliance or, or demonstrating that to, to government entities. So, uh, to not to put um, Steve and Ken on the spot, but I'm going to put Steve and Ken on the spot. Um, it, it, we're, this committee's <clears throat> tasked with with talking about collaboration, and 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 you know we've we've talked about kind of whole of state um, a, a around cybersecurity. What what role do you believe uh, academia as one? I, I kind of look at it as a three pronged stool. Right, you got private, public, and and academia. 
Um, and, and what role do you, what role would you see uh, academia playing in that, um, in that scenario where we're looking at whole of state? Yeah, I think in some cases, um, it can be a function of the type of work we do. And sometimes it's a function of the size of the organizations. And so when we think about um, tool sets that we might use, um, where we can use the same kind of tools, so we can um, create common, uh, common contracts, we can share knowledge on how to support these tools, how to get the most out of these tools, that kind of collaboration sometimes is a function of, of the type of, of work that we have, but sometimes it's just a function of scale. So for example, our, our RITC council, or that council of the IT leaders of the universities, the keyboard schools, um, we have been talking about things like SIM tools, you know, the uh, incident and event management kind of tools. And, and can we get some consistency on those kinds of tools uh, over time? Uh, so uh, two-factor or multi-factor authentication tools. And, and is there an opportunity for us to leverage the same types of platforms? Uh, so that, that kind of common purchasing uh, or purchase aggregation capabilities or uh, our affiliate adoption language, whatever it might be, um, that's certainly a, 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 from a spending perspective, a benefit where we can participate with other ent other entities, uh, but it's also for knowledge sharing and support capabilities. If we're leveraging the same kind of tools and capabilities, then we can um, uh, help each other out when it comes to providing better uh, support. But I think it, it what I've found at least is um, there is a variety in the type of work that we do, even within the universities. You know, some have defense oriented kind of activities and others have none of that. Um, and certainly education can be different from other state agencies. So I think it has to be kind of organic or you have to look opportunistically to see where those opportunities are and, and try not to force feed them. But as long as we're having these kind of uh, knowledge sharing bodies, uh, I think we're, we're, we can find ways to identify where those opportunities exist. And I would, I would answer that question further and that uh, Ken's kind of mentioned it, but I think academia could play a role in expertise, providing expertise. Um, just because of the size of the institutions, they have a, a pretty deep level of security knowledge uh, where they have it. And they also have access to a lot of tools to gain that. Uh, Cord had mentioned the supercomputer. I don't know if that would be needed in this case, but but there are there are a lot of resources available for, for academia to become I don't know, the knowledge expert or something to help disseminate some of that knowledge. And then I think the, my, the board would, would also argue that academia can play a role in helping to fill some of the gaps in terms of training for, for security personnel. Uh, and I think that's being looked at in a number of areas right now. Um, I, I'm not sure where all, but I've been hearing lots of talk about cybersecurity training at the universities, community colleges, or, or certifications or something. It doesn't have to be a four-year degree. Um, but I think, I think that's another area that academia can play a strong role in. Sure. There is definitely some of that conversation happening. There is another subcommittee on workforce development education where we've engaged the academic side as well on that. So I, and that's, you know, Again, as we start building a, you know, the subcommittee focus. Okay, so we've got these structures now. How do we communicate those out? And, and the challenges you guys see, and you know, as we talked earlier, and not hopefully not hijacking the conversation, but you know, things like the contracting perspectives. Obviously, the state can do things. The regions have a lot of power in their size and, and doing things. I don't know what that contracting perspective looks like, but how does that work? in the communication channel. So if the big three are doing something, how does that get trickled down to the lower, or not the lower, the smaller institutions um, and even the community college? I don't know how all that ecosystem plays plays into, into it. And I think that's hopefully, we're hoping to try and kind of to weed out and try and identify ways that we can uh, better execute on those, you know, scales of economy, things like that. Sure. Yeah, I know. In some cases, Jeff, we've had <clears throat> we've had challenges because um, academia, right, can get pricing that we did we can't get. Um, and, and you know, I see that like with the library, they can get E rate, and, and we can't. And I keep trying to figure out how I can put my IT department under the library um, so we can just E rate everything. <clears throat> I'm sure somehow that would end me in an orange jumpsuit somewhere, uh, but. Um, 
But you know, yeah, I, I think I think you're right. And and Ken, to your point, um, we just implemented Duo. Um, we talked to some of your folks because you guys did that a couple of years ago. So you know, there there are a lot of those uh, practical opportunities, I'll call them, um, that you know are, are could be beneficial uh, across the state. And not saying everybody you know goes that way, but but there's a lot of power to be had uh, from the purchasing side when, you know, you have uh, large entities that are all doing the same thing. You can certainly probably negotiate much better um, rates in terms of, of contracts. Um, and I know, I don't know about everybody else, but we're certainly looking at larger vendors now just because of the, the landscape <clears throat> that's at some point seems that that's all that's gonna be left. Um, be large vendors. So anyway, I, I appreciate, uh, I, I apologize for putting you on the spot, but I, I just think it's, you know, I, I like to get people's ideas from, from where they're at. So, sure. so thank you. So, oh, go ahead, John. Um, we heard earlier something about the annual check conference. And, and I just wanted to circle back to that for a moment, because as I was reflecting on how do we do awareness and training? And how do we provide um, knowledge or maybe informal uh, training opportunities to fill some of those gaps, maybe in the cybersecurity workforce challenges that we're seeing? You know, a couple different lenses there. Um, can you talk a little bit uh, about the Czech conference? Are there specific cybersecurity tracks there? Is that a way or a forum by which as we're thinking about how to get messaging and education out across the state? You know, is, is that an opportunity for the subcommittee to think about um, in terms of cyber specific needs and, and, and knowledge sharing? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the, the, the responsibility for, as you know, John, the responsibility for facilitating that conference shifts from university to university each year. Uh, this year, the responsibility sits with Wichita State. And so, yes, I mean, as we poll the participating organizations for interest in topic areas, you know, categories or, 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 or tracks, you know, I, I would be highly surprised that that didn't end up being one of them. Uh, the next check, check conference is May, if I remember right, it's May. So there is some time and there's still uh, some work being done to kind of develop what those tracks are. But yeah, I think um, we'll, we'll, I'd be highly surprised if we don't see a cybersecurity track. Um, granted that the topics within those tracks are going to be oriented toward higher education and, and, and examples of being a higher education context. But yeah, I would think that would certainly be a track. Yeah, there, there's always been, as far as I can remember, a security track. Um, there's usually three tracks and, and they change, but there's always been security. And, uh, you know, the Czech conference is, is a self, it's, a, it's an organic conference. So all the presentations are done by universities. It's all a volunteer kind of thing. Nobody's paid to do it. They they share interesting projects that they're doing. So it really relies on people to step up and, and share. I don't know that we've ever looked at going outside the universities, but but I think if there's, you know, somebody at the state who would like to present, I, I think it's been done once or twice. Yeah, I think that would be a great opportunity. Okay, thank you for that. I, I was just thinking about it as part of our challenge of education, awareness, training, um, you know, trying to um, share best practice across the state and bring more people aboard and, and, and bring people up, you know, as, as the rising tide for all of us continues to get better, just kind of bringing us all up. Uh, it seemed like there might be some opportunity there. So Jeff, I think you had a question. Yeah, I was gonna, uh, is that something that's done annually? Yes. And again, and that's just something that purely the reason, because again, that's as we're finding more and more things out, you know, every time we have a subcommittee meeting, something new pops up in the state that we just haven't been aware of. And hopefully that's the goal. And because again, like you mentioned, we, from my perspective, see a lot of good things happening. We have a lot of good capabilities and partnerships that we just haven't explored or even talked to um, about how, how we can start really capitalizing on those. So yeah, it's just, I am curious and interested in that, so. Yeah, it's been virtual the last two years because of the pandemic, uh, but we hope to do in person this time. It rotates around from campus to campus, so um, it, it, it's, a, it, it's also an opportunity to see, you know, different things going on in different campuses, so that's always interesting. 
So now I kind of have a question on that kind of segment because I'm going back from the other subcommittee I'm on. Is that purely on the, uh, for lack of better terms, the academic administration side, or is that actually within the academics itself or both? Um, all aspects of IT, I, I'm not sure if I understand. So, so, so is it like on, on the CIO side of the, the IT within a campus or is it back into also the professors within the programs oh, and things like that? Very much CIO part. Okay. So, so Jeff, that's an interesting question because that might be another opportunity where um, in the last task force meeting, we had a professor share about education and pipelines for training folks and opportunities. You know, um, I'm just scratching my head here a little bit about there. I wonder if there isn't some opportunity there about bringing some of those other knowledge experts that teach folks um, into the fold uh, in, in some other ways there or workshop capabilities where it's like hands-on, let's go develop a security policy or something. You know, I, I have no idea, but um, the, that's what I'm scratching my head about at the moment as you're talking about that. Well, and that's, I mean, it's, it's a huge landscape and obviously we can't boil the ocean with it. We don't wanna, you know, try and lump everything in. We'll never, <laughs> one of those conferences would take months to complete because there's so many different aspects to that. And, and again, I was just curious as to kind of what the landscape of this specific conference was. So, because yeah, that's something, you know, the academic side of it can definitely continue on their workforce development type thing without necessarily bleeding out. Granted, I think there is some important crosstalk between the two groups, um, but they do have very different focuses, I think. They do. And I would guess that crosstalk happens at the university level, but I, but I don't see that at the chat conference. Okay. It's good to know. So one of the things we learned about last time was the need for Security Operations Center. And um, I know higher eds have lots of users. Um, and, and so uh, some of the scale side of things, uh, especially in IT and cyber, they they're already working to try and solve in some ways. Um, you know, I don't know, and I might, you know, go out on this very tiny limb here and get hurt. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know, like from a security operations center perspective, if there's any thoughts or ideas or, or something there that could be used from that concept of scale from, from expertise and academia about um, could there be some considerations to think about what security operations center or, or something on that order might look like? Um, because it could function as an aggregation point, right, for some data and stuff as well for the analysis and, and, and sharing of that information that we've been talking about. Um, and then, you know, if there's other entities or maybe the fusion center or, or other ways in which to enrich that to, to have that broader context and reporting in, in a couple of ways, you know, I, I don't know. It's a very broad question. I don't know that I have it well formed, but but it's something I was thinking about. I feel like uh, it was at University of Nebraska maybe um, had done some work in this space too about trying to think about Security Operations Center uh, of made available in a little broader context beyond just their organization. So Ken and, and Steve, I don't know, uh, like I said, I might be out on a very tiny limb here, but uh, I don't know if you have any any thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, given the scale that most of our organizations have, you're, you're generally looking at improving your event monitoring, your logging skills, the ability to alert on, on suspicious behavior, malicious activity, things like that. But it is not a 24 by seven staffed operation, uh, even for the larger organizations. Uh, they, they just don't have the capacity and the funding to do something like that. So if we wanted to, to, to look at a capability like that, where we, we did wanna um, have somebody with eyeballs on alerts at two in the morning, um, I don't see a capability to do that unless you expand the scope out to some kind of shared platform. So, so and I'll, I'll pass that over to John from NGA. I know there's some states that have some larger models. Or is there any states that have models that, that have incorporated, you know, all these, you know, as you heard some aspects um, into one larger soft picture? I know I think California maybe in New Jersey. Yeah, California and New Jersey have those integrated cells um those probably are the two biggest examples and probably two of the best examples yeah 
the Cal sick and then the New Jersey kick. State government and the regents institutions and, and things like yeah. that to, to get that aggregate picture. Yeah, they, they have, uh, they, they have a pretty wide poll and then um, they're, I believe they're also both of them are linked or they're run through the their respective um, homeland security or emergency uh, management agencies. So I think through California, it's the OES, which is like their Office of Emergency Services, and then New Jersey is the OH Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. From a larger perspective, I mean. And you may not know the answer. I mean, was that a major lift for them with a lot of resource involved to kind of stand that up, or was it something just kind of organically started forming? That's a good question on what the uh, kind of the origins of that. Um, I believe they were they were originally launched from executive orders. Um, but I can kind of confirm that. And yeah, I, I can look more into that if, you, if you'd like. I think that might be helpful because again, these are some great, these might be longer term recommendations, but kind of putting some recommendations around formalizing a kind of a cooperative with the various different groups in some form or fashion. I don't know how, how we might want to phrase that, but. And again, with the different aspects of, you know, how Kansas is laid out with CANRIN and the institutions and then, you know, the state perspective and then again, localities and things like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, they, they were both launched by executive order. Okay. Just FYI. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. So again, I, I you know, I, not, not to get into the weeds, but, but <clears throat> that's where I seem to live, it seems. Um, but the opportunity, I think, right, uh, things that we cannot afford individually, uh, perhaps we can afford as a collective, right? I, I mean, it just provides, I think, some, some at least opportunities, like Ken says, uh, we can't, you know, we're not going to have eyes on it at two in the morning. Um, uh, we're getting alerts, so if if you know somebody gets woken up by their their phone because they have alerts going on their personal phone, then maybe. But but if you know if there's some way to to think about this holistically, where we had a you know something like a sock that that you know provided those types of services, then um, like I said, I you know I don't we we haven't done it because we couldn't afford it, but could we afford it? You know, across multiple platforms, well, it probably becomes a lot more uh, possible, at least. I, I'm struck by by something Mike said earlier about building trusts and, and relationships. And I think, I, I know other states govern higher education differently, um, but I think it would be, it'd be a hard pull to expect a, Central Security Operations Center to grow organically in the state of Kansas among higher ed. I just, I. If I remember, and John, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think a lot of I like the California model. It's the construct is there, and each major organization kind of contributes their resources to the bigger picture. So it's not just one taking over ownership of all of it. If I if I remember. At least, again, it's been several years since I read something about that. And that's where, I mean, by growing organically, it's these partnerships that are built in. You know, they may all be housed in kind of something similar or leveraging tools, but there's still some distinct ownerships still within it. Well, I think that, oh, go ahead, Ken. Yeah, I, I think there could be some, some possible benefits and some real challenges. I mean, when you think about... I don't know, uh, it's been a few years since I've looked at Splunk, for example, but if you wanted to do some kind of event, uh, you know, aggregation of logs and, and analysis of events, things like that, and you're pulling data from all these different disparate uh, sources, um, you might get some benefit by saying, let's, let's have a SOC 24 by seven looking at stuff and we can all contribute some funding or some resources. So that way 
you know, we can't staff our own 24 by seven operations, but a little bit of money from each group, you can kind of see the labor in, and figure out how you might do that. But remembering Splunk, uh, at least a few years ago, you still had fees based on the volume of data that's being consumed. And so, you know, depending on how much of a discount you get from your scale of, of your purchase, that's still going to be a big hurdle for us to kind of figure out how to overcome because improved evaluation of, of the traffic and improved monitoring, uh, if, it's, if it's volume oriented in terms of the billing, like, you know, better services uh, or better capability is going to cost you more money. And we might still uh, struggle to, to find the funding for that. But the, I think the labor contribution side of things being pulled together, that's a, a more uh, easily overcome obstacle. Well, and then there's the liability issue. I, I think every agency is charged with protecting their own data and, and to export that out to a SOC. I mean, it, it all seems reasonable and, and worthwhile, but there has to be some liability coverage there as well. Yeah. So John, I it looked like you might have um, came off mute there for a moment. I want to make sure if you had some additional items that that we gave you a chance to to chat with us. I, I was just going to uh, affirm what Jeff had said about the the CalSec and the Cal um, the, the, the Cyber Task Force. It's uh, they pull in um, all the different information from the different supporting agencies. Um, it's kind of more of they, they kind of pull it in through the ecosystem instead of kind of having um, kind of that ownership of the ecosystem, I guess, if that makes sense. Gotcha. So, Bill, I'm going to pick on you again. Uh, th this seems like it might be in your wheelhouse as well. It'd be interesting to get some of your thoughts about the conversation. Sure. Uh, you know, the, the conversation here has been uh, mainly about uh, a security operations center. And uh, I want to uh, uh, frame my comments with uh, the notion that a security operations center is a is a tactical function uh, in, in real time. It's what's happening right now. And how are we going to react to those events that are happening right now? Uh, because the, the fusion center deals in, in sensitive information and and I believe maybe next Wednesday I'll be briefing or at some point I'll be briefing on the overall concept of the fusion center and how it operates in Kansas. Uh, the fact that we deal with sensitive information, what we do with our partners is we help them understand how to make strategic improvements uh, to their networks. Uh, we help them identify uh, uh, strategic gaps in their network defenses and help them understand how to make those improvements um, uh, that closes those gaps. So we we operate in the area of what we call left of boom. If you're familiar with a, an, a, an attack chain or a kill chain model, we, we like to operate to the left of boom in that strategic area as opposed to operating right of boom after something bad has happened. And so um, while we, uh, in a given incident, we might be able to provide uh, uh, tactical support, uh, the fact that we're operating in the uh, sensitive information realm uh, makes it uh, sometimes difficult to, to apply that directly to uh, real-time events. And so um, I think maybe uh, I can talk more about it after I've uh, given my briefing and, and uh, maybe next week. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I appreciate the context there. Um, I, I think that's very important. Um, the notion of tactical versus strategic and, and how the different components fit together. Because um, it seems like there's probably space for, for both types of components about this, this approach that we're thinking about and, and recommendations and how do we stitch some of it together to provide that broader comprehensive whole estate um, uh, cyber improvement that, that we're discussing. So keep an eye on the time here. Um, I just want to see if there's any final questions for Steve and, and Ken. All right, seeing none. Uh, Steve and Ken, 
thank you so much for joining us and, and uh, sharing information with us and answering questions. It's been very helpful. Yeah, thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Nice to talk with you all. All right, next stage of our meeting, we're, we're gonna go back to the committee members for open discussion. And um, as we as we look at the tail end of the meeting here, I, I think it might be important if we could um, think about if there's any new learnings we've had or, or, or considerations for recommendations that, that we've thought about from, from today's discussion that, that we need to talk about or, or capture as part of our work today. I mean, based on the continuing conversation, just a realization and better understanding of just how big the ecosystem is and, and knowing that there probably won't be some sort of one size model fits all that works in this environment. I'm just realistically trying to think that through my head. Um, you know, and maybe, you know, what are some of those pieces again, kind of going back to what are some of those other avenues where we can almost divide and conquer in some of this space um, might be a, a point of where we should make some recommendations. You know, to, to Bill's point about on the strategic side versus the tactical side, there are very two very different distinct elements with different requirements and things like that. So how do we, you know, I don't say mind our swim lanes with those two type things, but you know, also make sure that they're communicated appropriately, so. So you mentioned a really interesting word, I think, ecosystem. And it just so happens in our organization, we've been talking a lot about this notion of ecosystem. And, you know, there's very tiny ecosystems, just like in my organization. Uh, my organization might be an ecosystem. Inside of that ecosystem, there might be a smaller ecosystem, specifically with the cybersecurity function. Right, and then there's broader ecosystems that we belong to for border regions uh, as part of the state and what have you. Um, so it, it just strikes me as interesting, this notion of ecosystem, ecosystem planning, and, and how do the different ecosystems fit into to the work that we're doing here? And are there similar, maybe smaller ecosystems that naturally could form together to provide uh, a better, more aggregate capability set in, in some way? So, um, Jeff, just a small riff on your ecosystem word there. It, it, it rings true to me because I do think that idea of ecosystems and at the different levels, um, you know, it's gonna be important to, to really think through that and then how do we bring those ecosystems together, right? That's really the goal that we're discussing in this meeting too, is how do we bring those into that broader ecosystem and, and, and leverage the benefits that can be shared across that broader ecosystem. Yeah, to some extent, even just identifying those ecosystems. You know, because like I said, I I knew kind of the basis of Canada and what they did, but I didn't realize they'd gone out to more than just the education K through 12, um, you know, what things they can provide. And, and again, that's that knowledge and awareness and being able to share that out and say, hey, your are your additional resources that can help with various things. Um, you know, I mean, as we identify those things and, you know, I found out earlier this year about what Wichita State does with their that are Innovar and then that are cybersecurity research group, um, you know, that's been going on for a while and I just heard about it this year. So, I mean, as we pull these things out, you know, how do we identify them and make them widely known? Because again, that well, both on the strategic and tactical or another like say going back of best practices or, you know, we're seeing this over here. How do we share that, you know, with a, a certain sort of cyber attack? Um, these actors are going after us, anybody else seeing it? You know, what are they trying to do, et cetera? I mean, that's important information on the strategic picture and also can start bleeding a little bit into the tactical as well. But how do we communicate and coordinate and collaborate that? And that's, I think, the challenge. So I'd like to jump uh, piggyback on to, uh, to Jeff's comment there. And that is uh, you, you cannot uh, manage uh, an ecosystem that you don't understand. And that, I spent a lot of time in the private sector and that was one of our biggest challenges was to understanding our own architecture and, and what, what we had uh, in service. And it goes back to a, a, a database of understanding what you have, not only in the hardware sense, but also in the, the, the systems and the interfaces you have between systems 
and interfaces between uh, organizations are huge because if you don't understand what's in place and how those have been implemented, you, you can't effectively protect those from a cybersecurity uh, perspective. And so I think that the word ecosystem is huge, uh, but part of that is identifying every facet of that ecosystem. Yeah, that's a great point, right? You can't protect what you don't know about. Um, you know, uh, even more simply, like, what are the crown jewels that we need to focus on first and foremost, right? Uh, because we talked the last time about the need to do assessment and maybe triage based upon risk. And and so I, I completely agree. I think there's aspects of understanding, you know, the ecosystem at different levels and then what capabilities exist in those ecosystems, right? Because I think that's where it'll be interesting too, because we've got to understand that at the different ecosystem levels, right? Because maybe at the lower ecosystem level of mine, I have certain capabilities, yeah, but maybe there's other capabilities at the next level up in the ecosystem that I could, I could borrow from or use or pull from that could help augment the work that we're doing. But if I don't know that they're there, then, um, you know, that, that could be, that could be problematic. It may put us at a disadvantage. And, and so I completely agree. I think this all fits naturally into what we've been wrestling with here a little bit over the last subcommittees about how do we learn what's there? How do we know what's available? How do we make that known? And then ultimately, how do we share and, and, and leverage that across the broader whole of state? And, and I promise you that an attacker is going to find your vulnerability, which basically in today's world uh, is um, an at unpatched machine um, or a, a machine that's at some revision level that has a vulnerability. And unless you, unless you know that those machines exist out there, you don't even have an opportunity to go out and patch them. But, but that, that's your Achilles heel in any network is, is an unpatched machine or, or, or something that's at a, a, a lower, um, a lower uh, revision level that's that's vulnerable to attacker because they will find those. So it reminds me of the NIST CSF functions, right? One of them is identify, which is really about visibility, right? We gotta understand what's there. If we don't know what's there, then we don't know what to do, right? Like we don't know how to protect it. We don't know what countermeasures need to be wrapped around it. We don't know what monitoring needs to be available. We don't know uh, perhaps even the value of the asset to, to drive what type of countermeasures and monitoring. So we are getting a little closer. I wanna make sure that we have some, some time here too to discuss, you know, as we think about the next meeting, um, what additional background information or other groups or organizations uh, that we may wanna consider bringing in for our next subcommittee? Are there any thoughts about that from, from the subcommittee members? John, just wanted to jump in here and good to see everybody. Um, I believe, and I just need to double check my notes, but I know Jay had mentioned someone in our last meeting um, and had provided uh, a contact for someone he had recommended. Um, and I apologize, I can't think of the name off the top of my head, but that's someone I can certainly reach out to and, and bring in if that would be helpful. Uh, thank you for joining, Ali. Thank you for the information. Uh, yeah, that's, I think that might be good. You know, is the, the subcommittee still okay with, with bringing that individual in? I'm digging through my notes now to find that name. So you know who it is you're agreeing to as well as I make that offer. Was it Leo maybe from the KCC or the League of Municipalities or Association of Counties? Yeah, I believe it was Leo, but I am, and I can still reach out to Leo Municipalities as well. Uh, Jeff, when we work with our, I'm sorry. No, please go ahead. When, when we work with our partners and, and there's a, um, we identify that there's an issue that needs to be resolved. Um, uh, there, the, the, the situation uh, usually is, well, okay, perhaps there's been a crime committed, perhaps we need to bring in the FBI or, but the FBI being um, 
a, a law enforcement agency, they don't do anything to help you fix your network. Uh, uh, they're about putting handcuffs on people and prosecuting them. Uh, the other option is the a DHS hurt team uh, that comes out of CISA. And so I, I suppose that it might be beneficial for us to uh, maybe engage those two entities to help everyone um, understand um, what options there are when there is a, a compromise and what help we have from from um, federal resources. So to kind of piggyback on that, Bill, since I know that kind of bleeds into what our earlier conversation was in one of the other subcommittees, um, I think that'd be more appropriate for the full task force. I think you're probably right there. Maybe not for us at, at this level. Uh, I suppose maybe something that's, uh, if we if they presented to the entire task force and then we thought there was something more granular that they could bring to us, uh, maybe we could contemplate it at that time. I know we were just talking about, and that's something John brought up to the other subcommittee is, you know, what they can bring to the table from its response perspective and again, how that would play into our response plans, et cetera. Um, you know, and I think that might be a, a good idea. Maybe we can, Ali, take note of that and share it with the other subcommittee as well that we might have a larger task force on that. Will do. Um, and then really maximize their time. Um, you know, and I, I think, you know, I'll kind of defer a little bit to Mike on that with kind of the, the league, the municipalities and stuff, because they might have the broader, I don't know if they hold an annual conference where cyber gets discussed and or they do something directly with CIOs and, and security folks within the league. Um, I don't know if, I think there's another association that a lot of IT professionals belong to. I'm not sure what it is, um, but some organization like that be appropriate. Yeah, <clears throat> if you're asking me, we I, I have I have absolutely no integration into that. That's the city manager and uh, and those folks and council. Um, so we do nothing um, at that level. So if, if you were asking me about NLC, right, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. So no, we're not. We're not. At least. I'm not. Maybe that's different in other states, but. No, so that, that actually brings up an interesting point, too, is, you know, do we need to also make sure we're addressing kind of from both avenues as we do stuff, both the, the, the business risk side as well as kind of the IT side? I, I so think we should as, as we've kind of, we kind of started off and I think we kicked off to almost all these committees with the idea that it's it's not about IT. Um, you know, it's about the business. Uh, so I, you know, I think that's kind of important to carry that theme um, throughout. So, in the lens of you know, the business, then, um, do we have any thoughts about individuals or groups or organizations we would want to invite? kind of like the the kccs in the league and the association of county type thing um as just so, integration points of you know how they interact and how we could better share maybe um and from that perspective i think those would be appropriate okay and and that makes sense to me i i was going to suggest or, or advocate that we look at having the league of municipalities and the association of counties come in because I think the municipality focus and, and lens would be helpful. I think the county level focus would be helpful, right? As we're thinking about the different ecosystem layers, uh, those to me seem like they can provide us some great context. Uh, KCC, I think that's where Leo came into play, if I remember right. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm supportive of that as well. That might, you know, I don't know, probably based upon availability, I suppose, uh, who, who might be able to join us for the next next meeting. And bear in mind, and I'll just throw this out from the bigger task. I mean, we still have the runway of all the way to December. So if we don't get them here before this first, um, 
per set of recommendations or just general discussion of the areas we're exploring, that's fine too. So um, just kind of a last minute remark on that. Gotcha, good point. All right, any other any other thoughts, groups, ideas? I'll just pick on each subcommittee member. We'll go around uh, and, and collect final thoughts here. So uh, Jeff, you, you're on the Hollywood Squares first that I see. So uh, I'll pick on you first. No, I, I, that's not the thing. This is kind of the the Pandora's box. We start digging into a little bit because I know, as I mentioned, there's so many avenues and so many things to discuss. Um, you know, I'm just trying to last you know, minute thoughts and just making sure we can kind of come up with some of those, I don't want to say simple because a lot of them aren't, but those things that are actionable that we can start getting some traction on pretty quickly. Um, and again, I think there's some easy ones about, you know, even the conversation with Canrid, just ensuring that there is some sort of regular dialogue with organizations like Canrid in the state and, you know, other partnerships like that, make sure it just doesn't fall to the wayside after we had this one conversation. So, um, I think some of those are very simple, very actual recommendations to begin starting that collaboration. So. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Bill, I'm going to pick on you. Sure. Uh, just as I said earlier, you have to understand your ecosystem before you can manage it. Uh, I think I see that we are still iterating and uh, discovering what our environment is for our mission with this task force. And so I think we're gonna iterate a, you know, at least a couple more times to find out all the aspects of our, of our environment. And then we can start to uh, triage and prioritize uh, which items uh, are the, the lowest hanging fruit that we can get the most bang for the buck. And then we can, can actually start putting some rubber on the road uh, with a plan. But uh, I'm comfortable right now with the fact that we're still in a, a, a fact finding stage. Okay, great points. Thank you for that. Uh, Jay, I know you're audio only, so I, I would just encourage you if you have thoughts or ideas, uh, please please share those with Allie and she'll be able to help us uh, get those going. Um, Mike, I, I'm, you, you've been helpful in, in, in a lot of our conversations. I just wanna take a moment, see if you have any final thoughts here as well. Um, no, I think I think one of the things that uh, that I did want to comment on is is uh, I think it's important for everyone on the committee to think at higher levels. Um, you know, often we we hear that well we're unique and we do different things, but the reality is we're protecting data um, and we're protecting systems. It doesn't matter if they're academia, uh, public, private. Um, so kind of like I, I have this conversation with our police department because they continue to tell me they're unique. And I say, well, you arrest people. And, and that's what every across the country does. So all I'm saying is take that thought level up a, a notch uh, to think about those, those commonalities. And, and sometimes I think we, we say we can't do things because you know we, we believe them to be unique when in fact at a certain level, it, it really is not. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of all the same. So um, I think if we can, can think at that level, that helps us to, to put things in place that, that may be you know, comprehensive and, and really take that whole of state approach. Thank you, Mike. That, that's a great point as well. Uh, I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, Ali, um, I, I want to ask you if there's anything else that we've missed or we need to think about here before we wrap up. No, I think you're in great shape. I'm uh, I'm working, hopefully as quickly as possible, <laughs> uh, just to get the notes cleaned up um, and ready to go. And that way, any actionable steps or, or homework that anyone wants to do, you've got that to look at. Um, and I'll I'll get to work on trying to line up some of those speakers that we just discussed. So you have those uh, lined up. For the next meeting, but also to Jeff's point, um, anyone that we can't, and also just for the sake of time, I'll plan for a few further out as well. 
Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, and always, we appreciate you and, and Cheryl's support uh, as we've been working through the subcommittee. It's been very helpful. Um, so I'm going to pause for just a moment. Any final thoughts before we wrap? If not, we'll look at uh, wrapping this, this installment of the subcommittee meeting up. I just want to say a big thank you to all of our special guests today. We really appreciate your help and, and information. It, agreed. It's been incredibly helpful. Thank everyone for all their time that they're they're contributing. So it's very valuable. So all right. With that, thank you everyone. Been a fantastic meeting. Appreciate everyone's input and support. And uh, I I wish you a good day. We'll wrap up this meeting and we'll see you at the next one.